Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Spatial Insights from Clinical Biopsies, Why Lymphocyte Relationships Matter. I am Kaylee Walk of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by UltaView. To learn more, please visit ultaview.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Gaurav Chatterjee, PhD, Associate Director, Research and Development, and Associate Director, Product Strategy and Management at UltaView Incorporated. Gaurav, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks, Katie. Good, um, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, Overall, I would like to focus a little bit more on what happens with clin clinical biopsies, how can we get it better uh, towards the next generation of clinical biopsies, and in, towards, uh, in, in that context, why does uh, lymphocyte relationships matter? So before we move there, let's, uh, uh, I'll just talk briefly about what, uh, um, what UltiView does and what is UltiView, who is UltiView. So in our adult view, uh, our, our mission is to develop products and services using spatial phenomics that utilize the emerging knowledge of human biology and enable the data-driven development of personalized cancer therapies. Um, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the spatial phenomics aspect, the term that we coined, and also how does data-driven development of uh, personalized cancer therapies can lead us to a better solution. Overall, our vision is to give every patient the best chance of a cure by revealing the true state of cancer. Uh, brief fast facts about UltiView. Uh, we were founded in 2015 by David Wald and Peng Yin from the Harvard's Wiss Institute of uh, Biologically Inspired Engineering. Our platform technology, the Plex or uh, ISP, which I'll be referring to the rest of the talk, is a novel DNA barcode-based multiplex immunofluorescence uh, technology that uh, uses DNA barcodes attached to antibodies and also with the signal amplification that we need. Uh, the, uh, can you, okay, so I think this is all good here. So uh, a barcode, DNA barcode attached to antibodies and uh, along with uh, supported with the uh, uh, signal amplification mechanism that provides higher contrast as well as better quality images for multiplex immunofluorescence um, uh, settings on FFP tissues. We provide a direct antibody detection technology that enables a very rapid panel development and higher resolution because you are detect detecting the uh, antibodies directly compared to uh, using a secondary antibody based approach. We are uh, optimized, we have optimized our reagents on formal infixed and paraffin uh, embedded FFP tissues uh, that are usually by, that, that are used routinely in an, an anatomic pathology workflows and labs and is a standard for clinical pathology right now. We are a full service company, uh, including manufacturing operations as well as CLIA certified services lab, as well as a detailed image analysis pipeline and associated team with it. Over the last uh, seven years, we have focused on um, uh, uh, getting four rounds of um, funding, including uh, above, uh, like including uh, over hundred million dollars, and we have extensive experience with over hundred antibody targets across hundred uh, more than hundred novel multiplex panels that uh, spans across like uh, hundreds of projects and multiple companies mainly working on uh, uh, in the biotech sector, including farmers and uh, like small farmers and big farmers. Our focus right now so far has been on immune oncology and we are supporting biopharma research, bio, uh, biomarker development and clinical development pipelines. So let's talk a little bit more about the current state of uh, the immune oncology drug development. The main, uh, one of the main things to consider is 
uh, towards towards getting uh, getting getting uh, good progress in the in the field of immuno oncology drug development is the checkpoint inhibition, which um, the concept has remodeled cancer care, and it's called currently complementing surgery, radiation, and cytotoxic chemotherapy as well as uh, molecular uh, targeted therapies uh, towards precision, precision medicine. And moreover, immunotherapy has improved outcomes in several of the most refractory solid tumors such as melanomas, lymphomas, and a set of other um, uh, a wide variety of cancers. But uh, so, so towards that end, we when we come towards lymphocytes, we want to understand why are lymphocytes important. So lymphocytes are the main underlying mechanism behind what we generally routinely call in the clinical uh, workflows as is it a cold tumor or an intermediate tumor or a hot tumor? Uh, it's mainly dependent upon how much your body's own uh, immune response is interacting as well as acting on the tumor. And it can range uh, 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 across a wide range of uh, variation depending upon the presence or absence of different immune cells as well as um, uh, 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 corresponding associate, uh, or associated immune responses. But towards that end, abundances, identities, and the location of these lymphocytes and also other cells in the tumor microenvironment matters hugely towards defining uh, the tumor classifications as well as your body's own response to a, a particular tumor. The field of uh, clinical diagnostics or the field of clinical pathology has been uh, improving but on a quite Low, slow pace. The, the complexities that we are seeing uh, have been uh, exponentially increasing over the recent years, but it all started with um, uh, uh, the H&E, the classic H&E staining, the hematoxylin and eosin staining that was uh, about like more than 50 years ago. Uh, that H&E staining mainly focused on the morphology and the morphology determines the diagnosis of a particular slide that you look into. And this is still currently the gold standard among pathologists uh, towards making a, a diagnosis on a clinical biopsy samples. But towards more personalized medicine, the complexity of the tumor microenvironment is, is, is important and it's driving the need for uh, multiplex biomarker detection on a same tissue sample. So the field improved from there, from the H&E uh, phase towards an immunohistochemistry phase where you can detect particular proteins. Now you're not only dependent upon morphology, you can detect uh, expression of particular proteins, but it is mainly has been limited towards single protein detection, although there have been improvements there. Um, but also the cell identity and the cell state and uh, the, uh, the predictive biomarkers like HER2 and PDL1, these have all been, uh, we, have, we have been able to detect these, but at a single protein uh, detection level. Um, and towards driving it towards more personalized medicine, then the multiplex immunofluorescence uh, assays and technologies came up more recently. The advantages with them being you can detect multiple proteins or multiple biomarkers um, on a single tissue section together. That enables a deeper cellular phenotyping based on uh, overexpression of one or more biomarkers on the same single, uh, on, a, on a single tissue section. This also provides us with a wider expression, a range of expression, because um, uh, immunohistochemistry technology being a catalytic reaction overall, it's very prone to make the markers or the, the signal saturated. So, and it's harder to get a differential expression between different cells on the same tissue section based on their copy numbers. So multiplex immunofluorescence technology is actually advantageous in that range, uh, in, in that sense. And by detecting different uh, biomarkers, more than one biomarker on a single tissue section, you can further dig, like you can dig deeper into uh, analyzing the intercellular interactions as well as the cellular networks between uh, that, that forms on a, on a particular tissue section. A brief overview of something that came up more recently and it's becoming more and more practice in the clinical uh, as well as uh, translational research space are tertiary lymphoid structures. The, the lymphoid aggregates and the tertiary lymphoid structures have been shown to predict outcomes of PDL1 blockade in this one stu study that we are a part of uh, in uh, on, on non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so uh, this 
overall detects uh, this overall shows us that uh, complementary technologies like RNA seq as well as uh, multiplex immunofluorescence technologies like ISP can be used together to make a better decision on strategizing um, uh, the the diagnosis as well as uh, classifying different uh, cells or different patients uh, towards getting a better for, for, so that each of them get uh, get a better treatment um so in in that sense it's it's a significant progress and significant step forward towards uh using combination therapy towards uh, making a better outcome or uh, having a better diagnosis some case studies about why lymphocyte location matters so this in this particular study that uh, uh we were a part of along with roche uh we were looking at uh, a therapy where uh, CD137 agonist has been uh, uh, has, were added or or like was subjected to uh, action that promotes the proliferation of CD8 T lymphocytes and that was administered to cancer patients and then we are looking at tumor biopsies stained with KI67 as well as CD8 and this is uh, also done with DAV uh, the traditional immunohistochemistry staining as well as ISP staining. But the main focus was um, uh, to classify the, the, the cancer patients based on like responding uh, to the drug or not responding to the drug. But what, what was found was the responder population had increased CD8 cells intermingled with the tumor cells. Uh, so they were in close proximity, while the non-responders had CD increased CD8 positive cells uh, separated from the tumor cells. So uh, the T cells are uh, not infiltrating that much to the tumor areas. Similarly, if we look into another example, um, we uh, uh, we can take a look at uh, this study RTX two fifty, um, which was subject administered to the cancer patients, that expands the T and the NK uh, lymphocytes, and the tumor biopsies after subjected being subjected to ISP staining and image analysis, we were be able to we were able to find out that the baseline biopsy samples had the T cells not touching the tumor samples. So the uh, proximity analysis can show us whether uh, CD8 positive T cell is, is actually very, very close to a tumor cell or not. But what we found out that uh, uh, on, on treatment biopsy samples, the T cells were in much more proximity to the tumor cells. So these are good indications about how we can uh, dig deeper into cellular interactions of particularly different cell types on uh, tissue sample and get better diagnosis of uh, a particular treatment that's uh, working or not working. Let's uh, talk a little bit more about the technology platform so that I can give you a better idea about how it works. So we have been focusing mainly on FFP tissue samples. Um, our technology is a platform technology that is primarily dependent upon detecting multiple biomarkers up to eight or 12 or even 16 biomarkers on a single tissue section with a fast and simple workflow. So we start with the slide preparation that requires an antigen retrieval and de-waxing. The, the panels are pre-optimized and they are species independent. So, and then we proceed towards, after, after antigen retrieval and de-waxing, we proceed towards an antibody binding step, which is, literally adding all the antibodies that you want to use for detecting a particular panel. It can be four, it can be eight or 12. You add all the antibodies together as a single antibody binding step. Each of the antibodies have a unique DNA barcodes attached to it, which are used for detecting that particular antibody. So as I mentioned before, that we are detecting the primary antibody directly. That leads to a higher resolution and that also leads to uh, us leads us to be able to detect more than more than three or four antibodies together because now we are not um, limited towards host specific interactions and optimizing that, but just the orthogonality of DNA sequences define the the uh, absence of uh, of a crosstalk between different antibodies. We don't mask the antigens because we are directly uh, detecting the antigens through primary antibody. And we don't use any harsh uh, techniques or harsh protocols that may uh, affect the morphology as well as integrity of tissue samples. After the antibody staining happens, we uh, move forward towards amplifying the DNA barcodes or extending the DNA barcodes using our proprietary signal amplification method. 
that increases the sensitivity of the, uh, the signal that we detect and also you can that, that that leads us towards detecting more having a more differential outlook on the whole tissue sample so that we can detect lower expressing cells as well as higher expressing cells as well as medium expressing cells on the same tissue section with equal efficiency and then after amplification we add uh, our fluorescent probe mixes which are reverse complement sequences of our dna barcodes but with the fluorophore dye attached to it and that's how we detect different antibodies with a set of four antibodies at each round and that's primarily because we are limited by the spectral um, uh, overlap between the different fluorophores or dyes that we currently are using in the translational research space so we can detect up to four antibodies at one round but this can be followed up with a very gentle signal removal step and we can come up with like fresh set of probe mixes which are four other dna strands attached with the same four set of dyes and image it in round two and overlay the images thereby getting an eight plex or a 12 plex images so based on this technology we offer pre-optimized view signature panels that can readily address your specific biological questions and uh, that when we say panels these are the combination of different antibodies that you're using uh, to address your specific biological question we have our fixed view kits which are pre-optimized with our off-the-shelf markers which are ready to ship the kits are ready to ship and you get um, either a fourplex or an eightplex fixed view uh, kit within a couple of weeks if at all if there is any delay because of supply chain or any other issues we also have a flex view eight plex kit where we can start off with the base panel of an eight plex panel which is uh, mentioned here as the fix, fix view eight plex panel but we have the option of swapping any two markers or up to two markers with the marker of your choice from the set of pre-optimized off the shelf markers that we have each of these markers have been extensively uh, studied as well as um, developed in, in Altiview so that we offer the best pre-optimized uh, condition for maximum or most the most optimal staining performance. And those are available, uh, we can uh, ship them uh, by four weeks. We also offer a UView panel, which is a custom uh, made to order panels of up to eight plex where you can choose any of the eight markers from our set of uh, pre-developed markers and we can create that custom panel and uh, and work with you and, and and ship them to you uh within six to eight weeks and each of these markers have been pre-optimized in terms of the conditions so that they don't have uh, any interaction with each other as well as they perform to their fullest uh, uh, efficiency which can be determined by a one plex uh, signal or a one plex assay and we have seen that whether you are detecting a particular marker in one plex or an eight plex format, the, sting, the staining performance is very similar. So let's talk a little bit more about the, the signature panels that we have. So it's mainly towards uh, uh, the understanding of you want to explore the scientific uh, uh, state of a tumor microenvironment or a specific biological questions. We start off with this base immuno 8 panel that includes CD3, CD4, CD8, and CD68 as uh, in round one, as well as FOXP3, PD1, PDL1, and cytokeratin soxtin cocktails for uh, tonsil and other tissue types like melanoma, um, where soxtin comes into picture. And apart from this base panel, we have optimized 13 additional markers, which are available for the swap-in, as I was mentioning before. So let's look into what can be achieved by swapping in particular markers. For example, you can get a macrophage 8-plex panel by swapping in uh, CD163 and CD11B from the 13 uh, optimized marker list to the base immuno 8 panel. Similarly, you can get an immune reactivity panel by focusing KI67 and Granzyme B, where you are for, uh, where you are mainly interested in the, uh, the reactive immune response of, of a particular tissue. If you want to focus on tertiary lymphoid structures, we can swap in CD20 and CD11C markers that focus uh, that, that that target more of the tertiary lymphoid structures, as well as you can have tumor infiltrating lymphocyte panel that are focusing on NK cells as well as um, other tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes 
by um, swapping in CD20 and CD56. So these are different examples. These are just four. I, I gave you four examples, but like these are there. Are the the possibilities is unlimited uh, based on your specific question or your specific previous experience with a particular set of markers, and we can work with you to get the most optimal panel that can answer your specific biological question. Towards like so for, for for getting a, a little bit more understanding about how our technology works and getting a little bit more confidence on that, we have extensively studied our technology as well as our assay to have a very robust spatial biology uh, biology biomarker detection uh, platform with very good multiplex immunofluorescence assay performance. So and we have tested it across uh, in a particular study. Uh, including 330 different samples, and our sensitivity of ISP was uh, uh, around 98%, and specificity for PDL1 was around 92%. So that goes hand in hand with the the, the current gold standard of um, of the technologies that we use in the clinical and translational research. Uh, but also because of the advantage of being detect the you you being able to detect multiple proteins or multiple biomarkers together in a single tissue site, you can diagnose challenging cases that require a, a deeper understanding of what's happening with the tissue microenvironment. Towards the assay performance, sustaining performance, we have compared our assay towards the current gold standard, which is DAB, and our staining of ISP staining and DAB IHC staining are very highly concordant, whether you are doing a multiplex uh, ISP or even a monoplex ISP. And our technology is highly reproducible across a wide range of markers for across multiple different runs, whether you are a single run or, a, or in multiple independent runs. And we have seen that we see very uh, highly consistent uh, readings across cell densities, which are positive for particular markers as well as signal intensities. But for particular cases, we also see slightly higher variability of unique markers with unique markers like CD68, the macrophage markers. And upon further investigation, we can see that we have starting to see or detect the inherent biological variability of particular markers across different serial sections of tissues and across different regions of tissue microenvironment. So we, we can even uh, dig deeper into the, the inherent biological variability of particular markers using ISP. Let's talk a little bit more about the spatial phenomics and what, what can we achieve with spatial phenomics current, uh, which, which can lead us to progress towards having a better uh, clinical um, uh, workflow towards personalized medicine. So multiplex data in combination of the, with the classic pathologist annotations can really show you the power of spatial phenomics and just how many types of questions can be answered. When, what I mean by that is you can have a multiplex immunofluorescence image, but also pathologists uh, being highly familiar with the H&E stain, we can even overlay a multiplex immunofluorescence image with the H&E stain of the exact same particular slide by doing a sequential staining and overlaying uh, the two images together. We can then utilize this incredibly detailed multiplex analysis along with the pathologist annotation to further improve and train possibly next generation AI algorithms, but also have manual analysis uh, supported by pathologists, but with more information given to them about the current state of tissue microenvironment. With an h &E sample, our it, it, it this, this being a gold standard for pathologists right now towards diagnosis, by detecting what happens with the tissue, one reason is uh, by looking at uh, in, in looking at H and E samples is asymmetry, particularly in cancerous tissues. And H and E focuses more on the recurrent morphological uh, patterns with that that has a biological significance based on the extensive straining that pathologists do, and uh, the the understanding that they have by looking at numerous images over their uh, career. But 
overall, pathologists also understand that although they look very similar, there are, uh, based on their experiences, they can detect stroma from a tumor uh, environments as well as uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which are these small deep blue uh, dots that you see in the h &E stain. But essentially, all lymphocytes look alike in H on h &E. So for example, if you take a look at this h &E staining, all the, the three cells which are marked uh, by arrows, yellow arrows, they are all lymphocytes. But how can we know better or how can we have a deeper understanding of what kind of lymphocytes are they? That's where multiplex immunofluorescence techniques come into uh, uh, picture, where we can detect multiple, one or more protein biomarkers for each of these cells and overlay that with the H&E staining and have a better understanding whether it's an exhausted T cell based on whether it's CD3 positive as well as PD1 uh, PD positive, or it's a non-exhausted T cell, which is just CD3 positive. So you can make that distinction between the T cells, but also on NK cells, which are like CD56 positive, but CD3 negative. So those distinctions and a much deeper understanding of uh, the tissue microenvironment can be achieved using multiplex immunofluorescence in conjunction with H&E images. And then we can go back to our H&E image and then have a better understanding of the tissue microenvironment. So this H&E tissue stain can be hyper annotated with the ISP multi-marker phenotypes. And moreover, our in-situplex assay, a fourplex in-situplex in assay takes five and a half to six hours. And you can have a fully automated assay run on uh, auto stainers like Bond RX. Uh, you can run 30 slides together. And because of our unique signal amplification technology, you can even use auto scanners where you can image up to hundreds of slides using um, the auto scanners like Zeiss AxioScan. And because there is a signal amplification uh, technology uh, or a step present, the exposure times are super low thereby having much lower uh, scanning time for particular slides, even if, with the, even if you are doing a whole slide scan. So the spatial phenomics using uh, powered by uh, ISP particularly enables this precise cell phenotypes, a whole slide quantitation and spatial analysis. You can have a correlation with the tissue morphology backed up by the h &E stain. And you can further dig deeper into the cellular phenotypes towards particular biomarker discovery. And moreover, on top of that, you can also have training of artificial intelligence and deep learning networks to improve the interpretation of the h and &E, uh, slides so that in the future, you can have uh, just h and &E slides to get a basic understanding before you dig deeper into multiplex immunofluorescence, uh, uh, using multiplex immunofluorescence with those slides. So for example, we can, but what I mean by that is we can start with the classic H and E stain for pathologist annotations to determine the tumor regions. However, when we accompany that with the multiplex uh, fluorescent images, we can dig a little bit deeper here. We can start with a simple DAPI nuclear counter stain image showing all the cells in the region and add the tumor regions, uh, like tumor regions in, in, in red by staining cytokeratin uh, or by detecting cytokeratin there. This is of course performed on the whole slide uh, scale. And we have the overlay showing in the, the, the in analyzed cellular localizations of and the cellular phenotypes that are um, there in this white circle region on but on the on the left. So you can see the tumor regions and the non-tumor uh, the tumor cells and the non-tumor cells in that particular area. But then we can uh, also detect T cells, which are stained here in green, which are CD3 positive cells, and you can see that some of the T cells have infiltrated into the tumor regions as seen in this white circle, but some also have remained in the non-tumor compartments, which are the two green clusters flanking the white circle. Now, with an additional marker, let's say a CD8, we can differentiate these T cells populations a bit further into cytotoxic T cells, which are in light blue, to get a better understanding of the overall nature of the T cells or the state of the T cells that we have right now. And then we can pair that with a macrophage stain, which is like, let's say CD68. And we can show that these immune cell clusters have been very much primed by antigen presenting cells and are within the tumor regions. And so they are positioned to attack the tumor cells readily 
and then we can come up with another pdl1 stain to see like as, as it's uh, shown here in yellow and we can see these tumor cells have responded by expressing pdl1 which is like which can be classified as more immune invading tumor cells and this patient might be a good candidate for anti pdl1 therapies so this is kind of like one example of diagnosis that you can do these stains, along with the proper analysis, can give you a much better understanding of what is occurring within the tumor microenvironment. And also, we can actually see how these cellular interactions are happening in the tissues. We just highlighted five markers here to answer one particular question, but this tissue was actually run with 12 biomarkers, and which can provide you a more data and clearer picture about the tumor microenvironment and exactly what's happening within the tissue. So you can uh, have a better understanding for like, let's say drug discovery or patient treatment, for example. How does a supporting image analysis pipeline help? So again, we can see the here, just some examples of what we can do with all this data. We can do a whole slide quantification and we can quickly run a whole slide quantification based on each of these markers, and we can start further strategize the, the tumor cells, the T cells, the cytotoxic T cells, and the macrophages and the bulk scale. Like, how, what's the percentage of tumor cells? What's the percentage of T cells, et cetera? But we can then generate a more detailed phenotypic analysis for all the cell types present based on expression of one or more of the particular markers. Like, for example, T helper cells or macrophages or immunosuppressive macrophages based on CD68 PDL1 double positive cells. And we can then break the tissue into different compartments, the tumor versus non-tumor, uh, as, as we you can see here. We can then use this defined tumor and non-tumor cell uh, regions to look at the cell population within these regions. This highlights a very important um, uh, function, which is the importance of location data, for example. Information about the immune cells infiltrating the tumor borders can also help uh, determine whether the tumor is classified as like hot or cold and indicates its potential for target therapies. However, we just don't have to stick to just tumor versus non-tumor. We can even segment it into more detailed regions. For example, if it is it an immune invading tumor and inhibitory, uh, inhibitory macrophages or even is it a stromal tertiary lymphoid structure or just different cell clusters, as uh, you can see in the in green. And you can have detailed analysis for each of these regions by compartmentalizing based on the, uh, the, the, the pre-work that you do for the image analysis. We can even look at the cell clustering throughout the tissue. So for example, here are two different regions of the, uh, of the tissue with similar, very similar cell numbers. But however, in the region on the right, if you see the T cells can spread out and generate more cell to cell interactions because they are very much dispersed, dispersed across the region of interest. So they can have more active immune response with multiple T cell tumor cell interactions. But on the, on the left, our analysis showed that the T cells are much more clustered towards the left of the, uh, uh, towards the left of the region of interest. So maybe there is some local inhibition uh, that's uh, of, of the prime T cells that's preventing any further dissemination of the T cells into the uh, tumor microenvironment. So for these reasons, spatial data is key and in determining exactly what's occurring to the tissue. So furthermore, proximity analysis can provide insights on how active the immune response is in this tissue. For example, the regulatory T cells shown here in gray can regulate the T cells shown in green as long as they're in the same vicinity. And the T cell, the T cell, which is not proximal to this region, they might be activated and uninhibited, uh, and they are free to roam and kill tumor cells. So all these analysis can tell you a lot more about the tissue. We then are able to summarize all these details uh, about the cellular phenotyping, a deeper understanding of what's happening in the tissue, and with expert analysis in a report, and then help you get to your specific answer. So our current image analysis package has these um, uh, features that we talked about, like multi, uh, multiple marker phenotyping of up to eight significant or relevant phenotypes for four plex, 16 for up to eight plex, and further segmented by tumor versus non-tumor regions of the tissue. 
and we include uh, a spatial phenomics report which includes cell quantification cell densities marker intensities as well as segmentation of different regions on the tissue so overall these things can as i mentioned before that these things can help you uh, understand the biological question as well as the state of the tissue or the tumor microenvironment that you're working on. So in summary, uh, analysis of the lesional tissue biopsies may be the, the only or the primary way to determine why a therapy works or does not work, and we can strategize next steps accordingly. And the multiplex ana analysis of these biopsies will be fully required to comprehend all this, the different cell phenotypes and the interactions that drive these lesions. And our technology is uniquely poised towards fulfilling the, the vision of this uh, uh, spatial phenomics because we can allow or we allow rapid creation and deployment of these panels using a very simple workflow that is integrated into the major uh, or the standard uh, pathology labs right now. We don't require a specific instrument. We don't require a particular um, um, technique to operate. And furthermore, we can definitively identify different cellular phenotypes using um, the H&E tissue context and provide uh, like supporting data to the pathologist to make a better decision. Overall, I think it would be good to have to bring the spatial phenomics technologies to, to diagnosis, uh, diagnostic use. Uh, but that would require a very diverse collaborative uh, uh, environment and agreement on the biologically based or intervention related outputs. And that is something that we are just scratching the surface in terms of uh, more targeted and personalized uh, molecular medicine. So with that, I would want to thank you and uh, I would um, happily answer any questions that you have. Great. Well, thank you, Gorab, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. We've got a few in the queue here. So our first question asks, what are the advantages of ISP compared to existing MIF technologies? That's a, that's a good question. So the one of the advantages of ISP, as I was briefly mentioning during the talk, is we are able to directly detect the antigen sites using uh, primary antibodies. So in that sense, we can detect up, up, we have been able to detect up to four biomarkers on a single cell with high level resolution so that you can further quantify uh, or for the localized the presence of these particular uh, biomarkers, whether they're in the cytoplasm or nucleus or in membrane, using a standard 20x uh, uh, fluorescence microscope also. Furthermore, our ISP technology is based on very gentle handling of the tissues that we work on. So it allows for further downstream processing of this particular tissue if needed. So we can facilitate combination technologies using the same tissue. So for example, H&E or even, even further downstream processes like sequencing uh, that are becoming increasingly popular in terms of uh, translation and clinical research. So this, these are just a couple of advantages that we can think of. Great, thank you. Another question we have here, is there a limit to the amount of cycles allowable? So fundamentally, there is no limit towards the number of cycles that are allowable. Um, as I mentioned, like we can only detect up to four antibodies in one, one round because of the optical limits of the current microscopes that we have and the dyes that we can get with minimal crosstalk. But we have tested uh, internally in, in our research um, settings, we have tested up to four rounds. Uh, thereby detecting up to 16 antibodies, but we have not seen any particular interference or any particular effect, like effect of a particular staining of a particular marker, whether it's in round four or round one. And that is highly because our signal removal and then reprobing process is very gentle and we don't use any 
harsh chemicals to, or, to, to remove the signal. And we can even go further, like more than that, more than four, four rounds. It's just we have been focusing on um, a mid to low to mid plex, but like faster and high throughput assays that can answer questions or answer specific biological problems uh, that the translational research and the preclinical research um, market needs. Great, thank you. Another question we have here. How much time does it take to run an eightplex assay? Yeah, so a fourplex assay I was mentioning uh, is takes about five and a half hours, including antigen retrieval and uh, the devaxing. Um, but after that, the signal ampli the signal removal and reprobing is about one hour, one one and a half hours. So it's not linearly the assay time does not linearly increase with the number of plexes or the number of rounds that you have to do. So overall, an eightplex assay would be more like an eight can be done within eight hours. But of course, you have to take into consideration the imaging time that you take between round one and round two. But assay time wise, it's eight. Uh, it can be done within eight hours. Next question here asks, how do you ensure minimal interference while detecting multiple biomarkers? Yeah, so our dealing with the crosstalk or the the interference between different biomarkers is mainly guided by the dna barcodes and we have done extensive research internally to ensure that each of the dna barcodes that we have um, uh, attached to the different antibodies they are very very orthogonal to each other so that they don't have any even partial interactions uh, which are significant in the time frame and the temperature that we are working on in the in our assay so that's how we ensure that there is very minimal interference between the multiple biomarkers that we have in terms of the detection side. But from the staining side, because we have primary antibodies uh, only and no secondary antibody, which have more of an interaction or, uh, or a crosstalk, we are safe in that sense that we will be able to have the interference. We will be able to have minimal interference as long as we choose the particular right antibodies that have been screened and validated to have very high specificity for a particular antigen site. Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up there today. Go, Rob, do you have any final comments for our audience? No, thank you. Thanks a lot for um, joining. Uh, please let me know if you have any more questions. Uh, my email ID is uh, here in the slide. And I'll be uh, happy to uh, communicate or uh, have a conversation with any of you later on. Great. Well, thank you again, Gorab, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, UltaView, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>